Hello, I'm Dr. Nisha Royal. This is me wrapping up a trip to the UK. I'm in London in Hatchland's bookshop, which was formed in 1797. To put this in context, Charles Dickens would have been 13 years of age. Um, it was just after he moved to London and just before he started working as a cleric up the road in Covent Gardens. Earlier on this year, I embarked on a project to write a book that would change the perceptions of how we thought about literacy and how really everything boils down to expression. I've been on my own personal journey in the UK to a lot of the establishments that I studied in, um, including Oxford and Cambridge, a lot of my own experiences. So this book is made up of a lot of my journey since the age of Montessori school upwards, but it's also made up of a lot of the case studies of the hundreds and hundreds of success stories that I've had myself, where we've just changed the outlook and given people a way to express themselves. This ranges from everything from early childhood, childhood years, from 18 months of years of age, to 72 years of age of expression in the business world with adults. The other main section of this book is that I set out to interview a whole series of people on their experiences of expression. This is everything from politicians, writers, ancestors of famous people such as Charles Dickens, um, dancers, musicians. So in short, this book has three parts. My personal journey to managing to achieve a PhD despite profound dyslexia, the experiences of the hundreds and hundreds of case studies that I've worked with, for a spectrum of ages and the interviews of a whole segment of society on their aspirations, dreams and how expression has formed their lives. I'm at St John's College in Oxford. Um, I studied here during my PhD. Um, I came to study data assimilation with the atmospheric physics department and yes it was as much of a mouthful as it says. Um, even though at that stage I'd been through university and got a first and taught my course, as a dyslexic it was exceptionally difficult to come here and study. Um, I felt very intimidated. Um, I wasn't really able to ask anybody for help to read the programming manuals or anything else. Um, and I in fact stayed just behind where I'm standing here. Um, and one of my biggest difficulties was that the pigeons woke me up at 4 o'clock every morning, cooing outside my bedroom. Um, so all round, it, it was a very, it was a very challenging experience. I'm really glad I did it. Um, and interestingly, um, one of the reasons why I love Oxford is because there's so many bookshops. Um, I bought my first book on dyslexic research here. It was called Dyslexia and Stress. It's, um, it's when I really understood that dyslexia was more than about reading and writing. That there was a whole expression element to it. That it affected your whole life. It affected the sort of friendships you made, your relationships, um, your whole way of thinking, your confidence, your self-esteem. It, it was the book that really opened up for me what it was all about and the fact that being dyslexic um, was so much more than just being able to read and write and how you needed to overcome that for life and um, for your work, for your research, getting through a PhD, going into the workplace, coping with all the experiences and, and Oxford was the place that, that really brought that home to me. So having been to Oxford yesterday, today I'm in Cambridge at Corpus Christi College. I also stayed here during my PhD. Um, I did a fluid dynamics course here. If the course in Oxford was intimidating, the course in Cambridge was just obnoxious. My notes, my lab manual notes was in a binder this thick and I couldn't actually read my notes. Um, the reason I came to Cambridge to this course is because there's the most fantastic full-length water tank so we got to play with rubber ducks and see standing motions and all the really exciting things that you read about in theory. Um, but I actually had to have someone read the lab manual to me and as a result of this um, most people spoke pidgin English to me for the whole course and they assumed that I was incredibly stupid um, because I couldn't read my own lab manual and were incredibly patronising so it was a bit of a breakthrough to be able to stand up at the end of the course and actually present what I did and for people to look at me go oh actually she does have a brain it's okay um, but you know it was it was an exceptionally intimidating um, situation to work in and I think the thing for me in the message is I never really talk about the hard sides of being dyslexia but at this stage like I had been through university I had a primary degree I'd got a first I had a levels a very good leaving cert and I'd done and achieved an awful lot and you think with all of that remit there you know they don't let just anyone come and study fluid dynamics in Cambridge but even having done all that I still had to start at ground zero and prove myself completely from scratch um, and, and that was just how it goes and that's what I really want to change um, I really want to change the idea that literacy and intelligence should be in the same sentence at all and that they do match each other just because I couldn't read my lab manuals doesn't mean I didn't understand the complex physics that was going on this is the Pitts River collection which is tucked in at the back of the Natural History Museum in Oxford um, 
when I studied here, I randomly wandered into this place and found the origins of all of the ancestry almost of humankind. Um, there's everything from shrunken heads to examples of early communication writing, 5,000 years old behind me here. And it was just amazing to wander through all these cabinets. And as you go upstairs, there's all of the material from the voyages of Captain Cook, um, all the sort of artifacts they would have found and brought back to the UK. It's just this amazing collection. Um, and if you really want to understand exploration, um, humankind, the need to learn, the need to communicate, all of the traditions associated with humanity. Everything is in this one building. It was just an incredible experience for me to come here. Hello again from Cambridge, still snowing. Um, so this is one of the places I found when I was in Cambridge and it's quite ironic. I probably learnt more in this visit than I did in the whole fluid dynamics course I did with the university. This is Kettle's Yard which is an amazing concept set up by the original creator of the Tate Gallery. Um, and what he did was he wanted to allow people to appreciate and understand art in a home setting. So he built um, a fabulous 70s extension onto a very old building in Cambridge and created um, this amazing art space with all of his friends at the time. There was, uh, there's Ben Nicholas. When I first walked into this exhibition, someone stopped and said, oh my God, that's a mirror on the wall. And it literally is a small space, um, like your average sitting room with a mirror on the wall. And as you go through the space, it's just phenomenal. It's an, a phenomenal experience of how to appreciate and understand and see the true expression of art in a home setting rather than a gallery environment. I'm Dr. Nisha Roddy. I'm here in London. I'm at one of the many houses that Charles Dickens lived in in his lifetime. Um, it's sometimes hard to keep up with him because as people were widowed, he kept the houses for the women and educated the children. So sometimes it's hard to keep track of how many houses Charles Dickens actually had on the go at any one time. When I started writing a book on literacy and literature and intelligence, I went back to read one of the characters I've always been fascinated about because how did so many people know the stories of Charles Dickens in the lifetime, in his lifetime? To put it in perspective, um, Trafalgar Square was being designed, Regent Street was being built, many of the train stations in London were being built at the time of the rail network that would actually, in the end of his life, take him back to London on a specially commissioned train so that the people of London could pay their respects to him. So how did a nation in that generation manage to read his books, know his stories, how were they able to afford them? Um, so these were the sort of questions I had when I went back to read Charles Dickens. And then what I discovered was that he was this fascinating man who had only two years of education himself. Six months of that was due to the fact that his school house headmaster took a shine to him and he actually lived with his headmaster and his wife for a further six months to finish that year of education. So with only two years of education himself, he actually went into child labour. Um, he worked in the embankment in a tar factory at the age of nine, and yet his own children, his first eldest son, went to Eton within one generation. Um, and he then travelled the length and breadth of the UK, um, educating people in his books and educating people on literature. Um, He's also the person who coined the phrase home because he set up a home in Shepherd's Bush to take prostitutes off the street. And one of the main points that he saw to actually rehabilitating these women was to help them to learn how to read and write. Um, so, and he was very strong-willed in the sense that he didn't want them to learn reading through just religious reading. He actually provided completely different reading material. He interviewed these women. And in fact, the pamphlet that he wrote to attract these women to come to the house was really um, profound and beautiful. He asked them if they'd ever had a glimpse of anything, of being bigger in themselves, of being something better. Um, and also, he really spoke to them about their own self-respect. So this piece of writing was used to draw these women to him. Um, so you have a character who was one of the first philanthropists, um, wrote more books than many other people alive, but yet only went to school for two years. Um, and he wrote for the poor people and the uneducated people of England at that time and yet made it completely accessible to them. Um, and the answer to my question was, how did so many people manage to read his books? Well, that was because he actually had a background in journalism. He started a number of newspapers in his time and all of his books were actually published as series publications on um, newspapers, on green newspapers that people bought in monthly instalments, which made it possible. And many of these instalments were then passed around between people, but generally the average print run was about 40,000 an issue 
um, in his heyday, which meant that it was 40,000 people at a minimum who got to read his stories. And if that wasn't enough, then he travelled around and read and did a lot of public readings later in his life so that the people could understand the stories. And he put on many productions of his work with his friends and all of these productions, the money raised for them was used to look after all of these widowed women that he'd come across um, and to educate those people. So he put many, many people through education. Um, so when I started when I started my book and I started doing the research for it, I never fathomed that Charles Dickens would be the most amazing character. But certainly he is one of the pioneers of literacy and making it accessible to people. So I'm in Charles Dickens' study in Downey Street in London. And this is the actual table that he would have written at. This house is actually from very early in Charles Dickens' career. Um, this only brings us up as far as Nichol Nicholsby, um, the Pitwick Papers being his first major success. But he always drew on the experiences of himself as a child, having had quite an idyllic childhood up to about the age of nine in Kent, um, and having completed two years of schooling there, he was suddenly transported to London, to gritty, dirty London, where he worked as a child labourer, um, off embankment. Um, and he always drew back to those times, so a lot of, for instance, Oliver Twist actually comes from his own childhood. His father was imprisoned at that stage for not paying his debts, so he remained with a lifelong interest in prisons, um, lunatic asylums, um, and the poor, and how the poor were represented and treated, and how their actual illiteracy really held them back in the world. I think Charles Dickens is quite a new, a unique character because he came from very working class, then went to very poor class, and then actually went to very upper class society and chose to write about the poor, the middle and the lower class in all of his writing. So he was someone who was self-educated. Um, he actually learned how to read, write and speak French fluently later in his life and spent a lot of time travelling in France, America and Italy. So we had someone who was very educated, very intellectual, but yet wrote for the poor.